All right, so hi, we are the Ryan Seacrest Group, also known as uh, the title of our study, We May Never Meet, But We Tweet. Um, <laughs> this, is, uh, <laughs> this is Alex Kresovich, Shannon Knapp, Sarah Ray, and myself. Um, as you can tell by the title of our study, uh, we used Twitter to see um, two things. If uh, interacting via Twitter creates a, a relationship that is a real-life relationship instead of a parasocial relationship. And we also looked at if uh, this relationship creates effective commitment to Ryan Seacrest and his programming and his brand. Uh, so what we did was a three-cell uh, pre-test, post-test experiment. Uh, we had a control group. Uh, we had another group that was assigned to follow Ryan Seacrest on Twitter and another group that was assigned to uh, tweet to him once a day for 10 days. Uh, we justified using Ryan Seacrest because he, uh, one of the 10 uh, celebrities we looked at, we narrowed it down to about five, and um, he interacts the most, he tweets the most, he retweets the most, um, and we did content al analyze his tweets, and um, he was the best person to go with. He's also a Grady alum, uh, and he hosts shows going on during this study and coming up next uh, semester. So he uh, was the best for both the parasocial and the effective commitment. Um, parasocial basically is where you uh, form a relationship as an audience member with a celebrity or with a TV personality. Um, in this case, forming the relationship was uh, via the Twitter relationship. An effective commitment is defined as uh, your commitment to an organization or your commitment to a brand. And um, we used a scale that was developed by Meyer and Allen, and it was more of an effective commitment scale to an organization, and we just adapted it to Ryan Seacrest. So I'm going to let Shannon take over the method. All right, well, like Emily said, we were a three-cell quasi-experimental design, and we wanted to be out in the field for 10 days. We felt that 10 days was uh, long enough for someone to create a relationship with Ryan Seacrest, but due to co time constraints, we couldn't really do much over 10 days. Um, so we did a pre-test, and then they spent 10 days in their uh, cells, and then they did a post-test. We used SurveyMonkey for that. Um, so for the tweet group, their uh, instructions were that, and their manipulation was that they actually had to tweet to Ryan Seacrest. We said that a tweet was anything that said at in front of his name with Ryan Seacrest following, or they had to retweet him, which is if you were to go to his page and um, click on retweet under one of his comments, or you could write RT at Ryan Seacrest, that's also a retweet. Um, for the uh, follow group, they actually had to go to Ryan Seacrest's page, go to his follow button, click on the tab, and follow him for those 10 days. And then for the control group, they just had to create a Twitter account if they didn't already have one. So we recruited from about 10 classes within Grady. We would go around, we gave them sign-up sheets and asked for their email addresses. And then from here, we sent them their pre-test using SurveyMonkey. They spent 10 days in their cells, and then we sent them their post-test. So that was how we did our recruiting method. So our two scales that we used were our parasocial interaction uh, cell, or two scales, sorry, uh, using Otter and Palm Green. This was a 23-item multi-dimensional scale that looked at identification, loyalty, and interest. And um, this was also a five-point Likert scale, so people would do, talk from strongly agree to strongly disagree. And some of these questions included things like, I hope Ryan Seacrest will achieve his goals. From here, they also had an effective, yeah, they, so they came off kind of creepy. <laughs> um, from the effective commitment scale, this was Alan and Meyer. Uh, this was also a 10-point Likert scale. And this talked about the commitment to the celebrity, the brand, and the um, programs that he's on. This is actually, I think, from a marketing perspective, it looked more at brands, but we adapted it because we felt that Ryan Seacrest is, in a way, his own brand. Um, so we also had another smaller scale that just kind of identified the social media use, how often do you use Twitter, LinkedIn, stuff like that. And uh, for our insides, we had 124 participants. Uh, in our tweet group, we had 46. In our follow group, we had 56. In our control, we had 22. Yeah. So our results were interesting, to say the least. A few demographic things were that um, of the tweet group, there were 423 tweets sent to or retweeted from Ryan Seacrest. They were the group that was required to send them. Of the follow group, it was 15 total, which makes some sense. They didn't have to tweet to him, but they did have to follow him. The control group, which had to do neither, had sent no tweets. <coughs> So the demographic information, um, 
Of our participants, ages range from 19 to 27, with a mean of about 21 years old, so kind of what you'd expect from college undergraduates. And a good thing for us was that 85% of them had reported using Twitter before the experiment. So we didn't have to worry about them having to figure out how to use Twitter and how to interact with other people. A lot of them already knew how that went. So with our two scales, what we did before we um, conducted everything, or ran our numbers, was we wanted to make sure that they could explain the variance. Unfortunately, neither scale, parasocial interaction, or um, a affective commitment met that 60% threshold that we were really looking for. So we did, ended up turning them into indexes. So just a summation of all the 23 items for uh, parasocial interaction and the 10 items for affective commitment. We were excited that um, the alpha for the paraso parasocial interaction scale was 0.97. And for affective commitment, it was also good at about 0.773. So for hypothesis one, we wanted to do a paired sample t-test to look at if over these 10 days people felt differently about Ryan Seacrest before and after in terms of parasocial interaction and, <coughs> excuse me, and affective commitment. What was weird was that over the 10-day period, people's mean scores um, for all the participants actually went down. They felt less connected to him after, and we will discuss that later. There are some potential reasons for that. So we also decided to look at the tweet group, um, just so people were required to tweet to him every day on both of these parasocial interaction and affective commitment scales to see if their mean scores uh, would be any different. And theirs actually dropped as well. So um, given that the findings were not statistically significant and our first hypothesis was rejected. For our second hypothesis, we wanted to understand if um, communication was mitigated, like if the people who tweeted him on a daily basis um, would feel the strongest in terms of affective commitment and parasocial um, interaction compared to the people who just had to follow him and the control group. We were encouraged to find that for affective commitment the results were statistically significant and that the amount of commitment or well, commitment in terms of tweeting to him and following him did play a role in terms of how people felt affective commitment to him. Unfortunately, it didn't go the same way for parasocial interaction. It did approach significance. It was uh, P equals 0.144. So it was good, especially compared to our last hypothesis. But given that both um, did not meet statistical significance, our second hypothesis was rejected as well. Um, and in the end, we decided to run some correlations. And we were excited to see a strong positive relationship that was statistically significant between a person's score of affective commitment and their score for parasocial interaction, among some other correlations that we did find. So. OK, so like Alex said, our results actually ran counter to our research and our literature. So uh, several reasons we think might have impacted that, one reason being especially for hypothesis one, in retrospect, we think 10 days was not long enough for the study. And actually requiring the tweeters to tweet once a day for 10 days exposed them too much to Ryan, and it became more of a chore for them than something they would look forward to, maybe felt a little smothered. So if we were doing it over again, we would do it a little longer and require them to tweet less, because we think that would actually be more reflective of a real life interaction. We also had some limitations in our study. One of the biggest ones was, uh, at the end of our 10-day period, our conditions were actually exposed when Ryan retweeted a message from a participant saying, hey, it's the end of the study, you're not going to get any more tweets from us Grady students, why don't you hit us back? He did that. And so before they took the post-test, suddenly everybody knew what was going on. So of course that skewed the post-test results. Timing was also an issue for us because, uh, like the group earlier group, we also fell into fall break. So we think that limited some people participating. So for future research, we would definitely do this again, only we would modify our method using some of the lessons learned this go around. We really feel like that more research is needed in this area, particularly because of the correlation Alex mentioned that we did find between effective commitment and um, the Twitter interaction. Also, we did find that there is at least some connection between all three of our variables, so we would really like to do it again. It's great for PR because people can advise celebrities whether or not all the time they're spending nurturing their uh, public is really worth the time. So thank you very much.